Hey everyone, I'm Adrian. I'm the founder of The Proof, and I'm here with my friend Steph today. Hey guys, I'm Steph, founder of Levitate Foundry, and we're here with So Young from EOS. Hi, I'm So Young Kang. I'm the CMO at EOS Products. What's going on? Um, so yeah, to kick things off, if you want to just give a quick rundown of your background and then kind of lead that into what pushed you to join EOS, and then we can get rolling from there. Sure. Um, so I have been the CMO at EOS for um, close to three years now. Um, prior to that, I like to tell people that I, I think about my career in sort of like these big chunks and phases. The first decade of my career I spent in strategy and management consulting, so not exactly the same as what I'm doing now. Um, then I spent about 14 years working in um, specialty retail. I worked for Victoria's Secret and Bath & Body Works, um, where I ended my um, my tenure at Bath & Body Works as a senior vice president of brand for all of personal care before I jumped ship and came over to EOS to take on a more entrepreneurial, um, different kind of brand. Um, and it's been a very exciting, very fast paced uh, ride here at EOS so far. I love it. Um, I know one of your key differentiators, you know, not to mention the branding, which I've seen around for a while, um, specifically the focus on bringing you know, joy and delightful experience to personal care. And so I'm curious, what was the inspiration behind that strategy? And also how has that kind of like evolved and thinking over time? Yeah, so um, it, it's it's interesting. When, when I first joined um, EOS uh, a little under three years ago, I, I joined with a mandate as the first ever CMO here um, to essentially reboot the brand. The brand had launched um, in 2008 um, with a product, which I, I think a lot of people will be familiar with, um, a lip balm that essentially disrupted a very sleepy and conventional and traditional approach to um, what's the, the lip balm aisle um, within food, drug, and mass retailers. And... Um, you know, the, the brand grew like, you know, skyrocketed in terms of, of growth and then really reached a point where it was plateauing. And they brought me in really to um, rejuvenate and reboot the brand and think about where the next phase of growth comes from. Um, you know, when I first came in, a lot of the work that I was doing was digging into the history of the brand and thinking about like what, what is um, authentic and true about the heritage where this brand started. And I really think that it comes from that spirit of disruption and innovation, thinking about things differently than everybody else was thinking about them. Who goes into a lip balm aisle, which was completely uninspired, not particularly trend-driven fashion forward and decides I'm gonna create an object of desire, make it look like nothing else here, um, market it through celebrity influencers and capture you know, the, the love and passion of an entire generation of people who were um, collecting these things um, and treating them like the, the, these prized possessions. Um, and I think that when you look at the history of the brand, that spirit of entrepreneurial um, innovation, disruption, and approaching what is a traditional category in a very, very different and sort of joy-driven, delight-driven way is the that's the piece that um, that I really kind of grabbed onto when I first came into this brand to say, there's something there that you can apply, not only to the brand storytelling um, and thinking about how we now as a brand think about, you know, our communications, our, um, our like our brand identity to um, uh, in terms of like the product, the packaging, um, our website, which we you know we're working with with Steph and the amazing team at Levitate um, on on reworking, um, but also you know how do we expand this into new other categories for growth as well? And that's actually been the journey over the course of the last three years, really starting to line all of those things up from the brand identity and strategy all the way through to product portfolio expansion, um, which has been um, a really um, incredible opportunity for us to now go beyond lip care and enter into other care, other areas like body care, um, you know, the shave category and, um, and others coming soon. Oh, yeah. um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious as a follow up to that, when you're talking about product expansion, brand strategy, marketing, I know you wear a lot of hats internally um, as CMO. So I'm curious, like on a daily or weekly basis, like what does that breakdown look like? Like, how are you juggling those? Oh my God. I like, I literally, I don't, I don't even know. Sometimes my, I think my calendar runs me. I don't run my calendar. Um, but essentially my, um, my, the areas that I'm accountable for are inclusive of just sort of more of your traditional marketing um, areas of responsibility. Um, you know, whether it's across uh, owned, earned or paid um, media, as well as brand strategy, identity, and the entire creative team. Um, also, all product innovation and development. Um, and then um, more recently, actually, the e-commerce 
Arts area, which really folded under me a little over a year ago um, at the beginning of 2020, um, actually right before the pandemic. Um, and uh, both the third party piece, so how we work with our retail partners on growing the e-commerce segments of, of our business from a wholesale perspective, as well as um, really launching our own D2C capabilities. So, so yeah. I no, I was just going to say, so can you imagine all of that in like, you know, whatever, like the, the work week, it's, it's, it's a lot of juggling, I would say. I love it. No, So Young is, is like a superwoman. She's got, she just does so much. I mean, what is the day-to-day -day life of a CMO like? I'm sure there's a lot of listeners out there that are wondering, what is it like to be a CMO? How do I get to be a CMO? And um, it's not all fun and games and having an assistant, of course. It's, it's a lot yeah. of work. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that the role of the CMO, there, there's sort of a lot of, um, you know, external, uh, you know, opinions and literature being written these days about the evolution of the CMO role and how it's become something that's very hard to pin down. And, it, and as such, it's actually become very hard to define success in the CMO role as well. It can mean everything, um, especially right now with uh, what's going on sort of like in the, in the macro environment um, with the pandemic, as well as all the other sort of things that are happening um, in the current climate. It's become everything from thinking about people and culture and values to thinking about, you know, commercial and how you're driving your growth and, and being really responsible to the actual, like the, the financial growth and health of the company through to, um, you know, bringing the voice of the consumer in um, into your day to day and in, into the inner workings of the company. And um, as well as like the, just all of like the creative um, output that comes out from, you know, everything from pre product to marketing and, and comms to, to just overarching brand. So what I would say is that like my day to day, none of my days look the same. Um, every day I, I carve out um, different amounts of time to be able to spend with different parts of my team um, internally, as well as with, um, you know, our external partners, like, you know, like Steph and Levity. And, um, and it can cover everything from, you know, thinking about, um, you know, what the a product launch that's upcoming and, and looking at like, you know, design and how we're communicating and how we're going to make drives um, through, through a new product launch to, um, you know, thinking about like what we're doing in our upcoming media strategy and how we're deploying our media dollars to best drive the growth of the business to sometimes it's about thinking about the priorities that we hold um, dear as, as, brand values and meeting with my team about things like diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I think that what's amazing about the CMO role is that it's many, many things. And what's really hard about the CMO role, role is that it's many, many things. And so um, if you're the kind of person who likes to tackle many different areas, I think that, you know, it, it can be, it can be a really, really fulfilling career path. Um, and it, it, it's like never a dull moment in, um, in my world. Sounds like it and definitely seems like it. Adrian, go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, just as another follow-up, I'm really curious. Um, I'm always curious about the ramp up period of getting up to speed in a specific role at a new company. And mm -hmm. so when you first joined Evolution of Smooth, like what did that ramp up period look like? Is it more meeting everyone, you know, defining things, getting used to values, getting used to workflows, um, or is it like getting to work right away? Um, just what does yeah. that look like? <laughs> Well, you know, I mentioned that when I when I came in, I was brought in um, with a very specific mandate to reboot the brand. Um, and the, the the longest sort of phase of rebooting the brand essentially is rebooting the product. Um, you know, especially because that falls under my purview. And rebooting product takes the longest lead time because you're literally physically changing physical things and objects. Um, and um, in addition to that, when you're a wholesale brand like we are, you have to not only do all of the work to come up with a compelling proposal, but you have to actually then bring your retail partners along for the journey and convince them that you have the right strategy and then work with them on the highly complex process of bringing in and turning over your entire product portfolio and assortment across tens of thousands of points of distribution. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of interdependencies in that kind of work. Now keep in mind, I came in to EOS in June with the goal of starting to talk to retailers that fall. So for me, it was very much a hit the ground running type of process where literally my first week on the job, I was already interviewing outside design and branding agencies um, to basically select someone to select a partner, which you know had to be done basically in week two or three um, so that we could be in with consumer testing by week 10 
with our proposed new product so that we could be in front of retailers and convincing them to come along this journey with us by week like 14. So, um, so everything was compressed. I am not only at this point directing our outside partners as well as building a team to kind of execute against all of this, but I'm trying to figure it out myself because I didn't really, at this point, have enough depth of the history and the experience and really just like that gut feel for the brand. So it was, it was very much was the, um, you know, the, the, the term that you've heard before, I'm sure, which is like you're building the plane while flying it. That's what it felt like for me when I first joined the company. Now, since then, I've been able to, you know, take a breath. But um, as many people know, when you work in a leaner, smaller to mid-sized brand, it always feels like you have more going on than you have hours in the day or people on your team or dollars in your budget. So everything, um, whether it's day one or at this point, day 1000, where I'm, you know, I think I'm right around there. Um, it's always about moving a lot faster um, in, in this size of an organization um, versus maybe some things that I've seen prior in the earlier phases of my career. Yeah. And I feel like um, just getting to know the brand and getting to know you over the course of the last few months, like you, you honestly, you do so much and you have, you're so incredible. You've pushed this brand forward so much. Like what is the future of EOS look like? I know I can remember back in the early days, like when I was a teenager collecting the little, the little egg shaped chopsticks, <laughs> talk about changing an entire generation. Um, there are girls on my team that are 10, 15 years younger and they also feel the same, right? So the yeah. brand's been around for a long time in retail. What is the future of EOS? Is it D to C? Is it online? Is it, you know, global? Like, what are you guys looking at? What, what's your mandate? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that uh, like many brands, if you're, if you're not thinking about what your approach is to um, e-commerce and, um, and also omni-channel, if you're a wholesale brand like we are, um, the, the, the future's not going to look very bright for you because if we've seen anything, that acceleration of e-commerce adoption that's happened over the course of the past year means that fundamentally consumer behavior has completely shifted. And so we saw that in our business. We saw that in our business, not only with, um, you know, just tremendous organic growth in our own D2C channel um, in terms of percentage growth, as well as like multiples growth um, in the, um, in our omni-channel business and the distortion towards the e-commerce percentage of sales across a number of our retail partners. So yes, e-commerce is very much in our future. We happen to be a brand that um, already is, has a high degree of passion and engagement with the younger consumer, who's also more likely to adopt sort of new ways of conducting commerce. And so we're always thinking about what that means um, in terms of connecting the dots between maybe some things that we already do very well, like having millions of social media fans across multiple platforms, including you know over half a million followers on TikTok, which basically just happened in the last 12 months. Um, but how do you then take that and convert, uh, or not to convert, but like connect the dots between community and commerce? That's gonna be sort of where the future I think um, is, is looking really bright for EOS. I'd say from a business perspective as well, we are, um, we have launched new categories of business. And so we are now becoming and like full fledged a multi category personal care brand versus a lip balm brand. And that's very much a deliberate part of the strategy that we set into motion um, a couple of years ago when I joined. In fact, um, you know, one of the, the most amazing th things is seeing, for example, our shave prep business, which or our shave cream business, is now um, you know one of the top brands nationally across a number number of retailers, and that's really um, been something that's been growing slowly over the course of a few years. And then we actually just in the last month had a um, a somebody post a, a TikTok that went completely viral um, and got over 16 million views, I think, and like five million likes and completely upended our entire um, shave cream business and catapulted us um, to being a top brand in this category, um, in some cases bigger than existing conventional, um, you know, big brands that you, household names that you would have heard of. So it's really exciting to see the, um, the amount of potential and growth in this brand. And um, I feel really fortunate to be in this position where I can, um, you know, lead this team into really great, positive new places. Amazing. Community. I love what you just said. The brand meets community. It just, I have an idea for you. We'll talk about it later. But okay. I, I love <laughs> that. And like, let, let's talk about content for a second because that TikTok video did go viral and I watched it myself so many times. Very great, convincing. Can't believe it was UGC. I know we sent out an email about that and blasted it. Um, but tell me more about content meets EOS. Like, yeah. 
how is that going to change the future? What are your thoughts around content, digital, all these new apps and technologies that are popping up that weren't available 15 years ago? Like, how is that going to change branding and marketing for EOS? So I think it's it's a re, it's like a really important strategic question that you're just asking. Um, and I think that if I look back on the, on where we are today, our our belief is that our owned relationship with our community and our audience and our fans, our super fans across social media, is an incredible advantage that we have as a brand because it allows us to speak directly to our fans slash consumers. Um, and it's something that I think is, um, it's not as common in, um, you know, just sort of this wholesale CPG world, but, um, but we have benefited from having approached this category in a very different way, maybe than some of our competitors have. And as a result, we have this equity, this massive equity where we get to have direct conversations with our consumers every single day across different platforms, whether it's, you know, like Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, um, so many different places where we're literally just engaging with people on a daily basis and, and, and able to share with them who we are as a brand um, through the content. Um, able to share with them um, new product and um, therefore just have this direct channel. I think of it as sort of, I think of our social media as um, sort of like the digital equivalent to the store that you wander into. So in the old days, like you wander, you know, when I was a teenager, like I'd go to the mall and wander from store to store. I wasn't necessarily buying anything. I was just kind of checking out what's going on. Right. And I think of social media very similarly. Like it's, it's where people browse. It's where people explore. It's where people research. Now, wouldn't it be great? if through advances in social commerce, we could connect the dots and create a more frictionless experience, it becomes the place where people shop too. And we have obviously, you know, like many brands been um, working towards making those connections um, with, our social, with our social media through to commerce to really kind of take advantage of social commerce. What I would say is I, I haven't necessarily seen yet that the behavior is, um, it, it hasn't become um, like quite native yet. And I think part of that is just maybe the clunkiness in the interfaces and, and maybe it's not quite frictionless enough yet, but that is the holy grail. Um, and I do think that that's going to be a tremendous advantage for us when we can get to that, that, get to that point because the content will drive commerce. Yep. I love that so much. Remind me, I'm going to slack you after this about a beta program actually okay. with Instagram that I think we should do. Um, so many ideas turning, so exciting. That's awesome. Adrian, do we have, I know we're like at time. Do we have any other questions for? Yeah, we're seven? almost at time. Yeah, I guess seeing, uh, I mean, just looking into the rest of 2021, are there any specific highlights or expansion plans? I know you mentioned a few that, that you, you can talk to about with us um, that you're hyped about. Yeah, so, um, you know, as I mentioned, we are um, really excited about the growth that we're, sh we're seeing in our, um, our shave business. We haven't even really fully entered into the season quite yet. Typically, it's, it, it is a pretty seasonal category, but typically it doesn't really take off until the weather gets warmer. So for us to be seeing this sort of strong double-digit growth in a category that isn't even hitting its stride yet is really, really exciting for us. In addition to that, we very recently, in the last few months, launched an entire body care portfolio as well. Um, and that's a very exciting new area for us. We are today launching a new hand sanitizer that is unlike anything that anybody has experienced before. It's incredibly nourishing, hydrating. It feels great on your skin. And I don't think anybody can say that about hand sanitizers, especially after this year that we've been through. I'm sure we've all tried our fair share of sanitizers. So a lot of really stuff, hap uh, exciting stuff happening from a, um, from a product perspective. I'm incredibly excited about the work that we're doing to completely revamp and re-envision our um, D2C experience with the Levitate team. I think that what's coming there is going to completely be a game changer for us in terms of our channel strategy, which, um, you know, more to come on that very shortly. Um, and then we're still continuing to um, really drive like great content and brand stories through the wonderful work that our marketing team is doing across our own channels, as well as continued investment in, um, in sort of like the top of funnel paid marketing that we do. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. All very exciting. Leon knows her stuff, man. You want to hire a great CMO? <laughs> right here. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. This was super informative. I'm so excited for the future of EOS. And thank you so much for your time today, So Young. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Likewise. See you. Bye. Thanks.